شكرا دكتور هشام هنبتدي أه باول سبيكر أه دكتور احمد حازم مدرس جراحه العظام أه في الاسم هيدينا محاضره على بون فورم اند فانكشن اتفضل السلام عليكم جميعا so let's start our basic science course with how the bone the bone is formed and how it accommodates for its function we're starting the presentation i would like to all you i would like to invite you all to our website orthopedics.castrolaini.edu.eg where you can go inside and find our e-learning website, Cairo University Orthopedics e-learning portal, what we name CORE. You will find plenty of presentations that will help you in your practice, your examination, and your life. As a member of the HIP team, I would like to invite you for our, our upcoming courses. In February, we have a basic HIP replacement course where you will, we, you will hear everything about the HIP replacement the basics of the hip replacement. And in April, we will organize uh, the second understanding complex hip pathology, where you will hear about the complex hip pathology, everything about it. So, my objective of, the objectives of our, my presentation is to understand first what the bone, the bone structure, what the bone is formed of, and how this has a relationship to its function. So, let's start the vice versa. What's the function that we need from our bone to have a structure that is accommodated to this function? We need the bone. It's our mechanical strength. It provides support for our body, muscle attachments, organ protection, weight bearing. It's the strut on which we are supported. As well as it is the mineral reservoir for the calcium, for the phosphorus, as well as the marrow elements where we find a plenty of cells that, is, that enrich our circulation. So. Let's start with the gross anatomy, the macroscopic bone structures. We have two types of macroscopic bone structures if we look at it. The compact, or what we name the cortical bone, the cancellous, or the trabecular, or the spongy bone. What's the difference between them? If we look at the trabecular bone, we will find it that it's formed of struts. The struts is formed of wide things that we name plates, and they are connected by narrow things that they are named rods. The, cor the trabecular bone is different from the cortical bone that, we ha that it's had a wide uh, high, per high porosity that, re that it varies from 30 to 90 percent according to the area in which it's uh, present. While the compact bone, which is about 80 percent of our skeleton, it's formed of highly packed bone lamellae, and it has a low turnover as compared with the spongy or the trabecular bone. So let's go back to the basics. What's the difference between the stress and the strain? The stress is the force that is applied for a specific area. So our bones is composed, uh, is, is always subjected to different stresses in different directions. And it responds to this stress by a deformation force or what we name the elongation or what we name the strain. So the deformation or the elongation that happens in response to the stress, we always name it the strain. And, it, and it's measured in, in, in terms of percentage to the original height. We always look at this graph, the stress, the force, as compared to the elongation or the deformation that happens. So what do we need from our bone as compared to the stresses that's always subjected towards? We need the bone to have a good young modulus of elasticity according to its function. So the cancellous bone will have a young modulus of elasticity, the percentage of elongation as compared to the stress applied to it, and the other side, the cancellous bone, will have another young modulus of elasticity that is adapted to this function. So, if we look at the relationship between the bone form, the cortical bone, and the function of it, we'll find that the cortical bone has a young modulus of elasticity that's the, the deformation force in comparison to the stress applied as compared to the stainless steel, for example, or the titanium, as compared to the metals. So, it's very strong. It deforms very little as compared to very high stresses that's applied to it. While the, if we look at, and this is applied to the function of the cortical bone. So if we look at the cortical bone that's applied in the metaphysis, we will look that when you apply a force in it, 
It's responsible for the distribution of force evenly across the spongy bone below it. So it's there in the metaphysis or the epiphysis to distribute the stresses evenly across the other type of bone. While in the diaphysis, it's responsible for the load bearing and taking the loads and standing still in, in, uh, in front of the high stresses that it takes. If we look at the cancellous bone, we will find it that it has a low modulus of elasticity as compared to the tendons and cartilage. Sorry, this is cancellous bone, not cortical bone. Uh, this, uh, uh, it has a very low uh, young modulus of elasticity. This means that it deforms in a large amount in response to low stresses. And this is what we name spongy type of bone. So how this is accustomed to the function? We always find this cancellous bone is near our joints, and it's there to act as a job, uh, as a uh, as a shock absorber, protecting our cartilage and a joint. So it takes the shock, it acts as a shock absorber material around the joint. If we look at the microscopic bone structure, we will find that we have two types of bone. What we name primarily or woven bone. This is rapidly formed. It's randomly oriented. It's not stress oriented. While the second that we all have in normal bone, either cortical or cancellous, they are formed of, by remodeling of the, nor, uh, of the easily or the rapidly formed bone, the woven bone, and it's organized and it's stress-oriented. So, if we compare the primary bone to the, uh, to the remodeled bone or the secondary bone, we will find that the primary bone is, has less minerals. So it's easier to be removed also. So it's rapidly formed and it's rapidly removed. While in the secondary bone, it's stress-oriented and it's stiffer and it can withstand more forces. So how is this applied to the function? For example, in fracture healing, the primary bone or the woven bone is formed rapidly to stabilize the fracture. So if you have no stability, relative stability, and then the woven bone, it stabilizes the fracture mold, transferring it to absolute stability, which give a chance for bone remodeling and finally ending into the normal or the secondary bone or the remeller, the stress-oriented bone that you can withstand normal stresses on it. We have to have a bone that is accustomed to, uh, to, uh, to function against different types of stresses. Tensile stresses, compression stresses, and torsional stresses. And for Simplification of material, I always compare this to the, what we name the in, uh, reinforcement concrete, al kharasana al musallaha If we look at the building, we will find that it's composed of a concrete, sand, rocks, a dabsh as one matter, and the other matter, stainless steel or the iron. The iron is responsible to provide the tensile strength, uh, strength of the building, while the dabsh, the concrete, the cement, the cement, and the rocks is responsible for uh, to antagonize the compression stresses. So how our bone is accustomed like this, the reinforcement concrete or the kharasana musallah. We need something to antagonize the tensile stresses, the compression stresses, and the torsional stresses. If we look at the bone, we will find that it has a similar structure, similar to the steel that we use in the normal bendings. What we name the collagen type one or the triple helical structure, the proteins, the collagen type one, it's, it looks longitudinally, and it's responsible for resistance of tensile stresses, exactly like the steel. What about the compression stresses? You will find that the minerals or the calcium phosphate crystals in a different forms is responsible for resistance of the compression stresses, and it's equal to the, in the normal building to the concrete. So, what about the torsional stresses? Collagen is responsible for tensile stresses. Compression is, is antagonized by the crystals, mineral crystals. What about the torsional stresses? We will find that the bone is weak in torsional stresses. It antagonizes the torsional stresses by the combination of both the collagen and the crystals. But it has no specific structure that resists torsional stresses exactly. And that what we name the bone is anisotopic. Its modulus is dependent upon the direction of loading, so it acts differently according to where the loads come from. It's very strong in compression, weaker against tension, and it's very weak against torsion. The same thing that we always name that the bone is viscoelastic. 
which means that it's rate dependent. So when we find a high or a fast loading, we'll find that the trabecular bone is much stiffer than if it's loaded in a slow matter. So that's the final composition of the bone. Resistance against compression, it's mineral, which is 70% of our structure, while resistance against the tensile, it's the organic matrix or the collagen type one, and the responsible material that is responsible for the maintenance is the cells. Let's have about our cells. We have three types of cells. Bone forming cells, which comes from the marrow or the periosteum. They're responsible for the regulation of the remodel process by activation and deactivation of osteoclastic activity. The bone resorbing cells, which comes from the blood, hemopoietic in origin, they are formed of multinucleated cells and they are responsible for dissolution or dissolution, the dissolve of the organic and inorganic material. The third cell is the osteocyte, which is for, for till now, they do not find a specific function for it, but some theories state that it's responsible for the regulation of bone hemostasis. Others say that it's their sta stem cells or stationary cells that, we that will be transferred to other types of cells later on. So the regulation of the bone form and function is the process of remodeling. So why do we need remodeling? We need remodeling to replace the aged tissues, to act against the demanding or the changing mechanical demands according to the age, according to the stresses applied at different parts. So what we name the remodeling makes the bone a dynamic state. It's a continuous process and it varies according to the age. Sometimes you have a, uh, it, it, they have a full turnover between four to 20 uh, days depending on your age. Remodeling differs, it's sometimes a surface phenomena like in a trabecular bone and it's a, a cavity foramina like in the cortical bone. But in these two types of bone, it depends on a coupling mechanism, an interaction between an osteoblast and an osteoclast. The osteoblast takes the upper hands and its function, it regulates the action of the osteoclasts. So this is managed through what we name the rank, the rank ligand. So if you have a stimulus, the osteoblast secretes something that, activate, that activates the osteoclast. How this happens? We have a special receptors on the monocytes of the osteoclast that once it's attached to the rank produced by the, osteo uh, the osteoblast in response to a stimulus, this monocyte will bind with another monocyte forming the multinucleated osteoclast and starting bone resorption process. Once you are finished and you want to stop the, 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 the osteoclastic activity, the osteoblast is stimulated by another stimulus that produces another thing that blocks this rank ligand. So what we name the OPG. So for example, if you're in need of calcium, we all know that the bone is the reservoir of calcium in our body. If you have a low hypo or hypocalcemia, a low calcium level in the blood, the PTH is stimulated, the parathormone, is secreted in your blood. And this goes to the osteoblast to stimulate the rank. The rank will activate the bone resorption by letting the osteo uh, osteoclast bind together the monocytes, forming the multinucleated bone and starts bone resorption and starting secreting calcium in the blood again. The same happens with the estrogen, for example. Estrogen is a bone preserving hormone. It's responsible to have the strong bone of the females until the age of menopause. So it always stimulates the osteoblast to secrete the blocking material. While uh, the, uh, the, some other hormones act directly on the osteoclasts, like for example, the calcitonin. So we always speak about that the osteoblast is the upper hand, but till now it's less understood the vice versa. Is osteoclastic produce, the, does the osteoclast produce a reverse material that blocks the osteoblastic activity? This is less understood, but of course it happens, and we will read. So regulation of bone material depends on different factors. Physiological, like the age. Biological, like different hormones, like the PTH and calcitonin and things like this. Also the mechanical stresses, as we always state about the anatomist who described the Wolf's law or the mechanical stresses. And this has been explained recently by the positive and the mechanical and the negative charges present. So the negative charges is always present on the, uh, uh, on the tensile surface and the positive charges are always present on the compression surface, stimulating or regulating the bone 
uh, resorption and formation. So in summary, trabecular bone is a structure that is responsible for shock absorbent and always present near the joint. Collagen type 1 is responsible for tensile stresses. Minerals are responsible for compression. Bone is weak in torsion. Bone is anisotropic and viscoelastic. Bone is in a continuous dynamic state, in a continuous state of remodeling that differs according to the age and different stresses. Coupling mechanism is always present between the osteoblast, which has the upper hand, and osteoclast. Thank you. بنشكر دكتور أحمد حازم على وقتك مظبوط جداً